Okay. I was, you want me to say my name? Sure, yeah. Glenn Howard, Glenn G. Howard. Uh, I was born in 8-11-34, August 11th of 80-34. I, uh, my dad was George Howard. He owned the boat shop of Howard Brothers. There was five of us brothers. George was the oldest. Marvin was the next one, next to the oldest. And I was the third brother. And Louie was the younger one, one of the younger ones, and Roger was the youngest. The boathouse was built in 1939. Uh, I seen a cousin uh, get his hips broke from our sliding doors that the, when the boathouse was not done yet. I think they were working on the work benches and we were young kids running around the place. I must have been almost six for what I can remember because I seen the doors fall on him and heard him screaming. And uh, there was no bone doctors here and uh, he eventually passed away because his hips were crushed and he was distorted so far. So they were wooden doors? Or sliding doors for, for the front of the boat shop. On the street side? Yes. So Those were, were standing up almost straight up and we were running around there and uh, the doors fell over on him, all the doors. The door doorway for the shop, I think, was 10 or 12 feet wide. You know, and that's what fell over on him. How old was he? I would think he was about eight or nine. Wow. So how was he related to you? Was he, he was my cousin. Your, so your um, mother's brother's? Yes. Wow. What was his name? Rudy. Or what was his last name? Daniels. Um, so when you had uh, sisters also? Yes, I had uh, eight sisters. Inez was the oldest. Um, I think my sister Ginger or Shirley is the next one. Diane. Gina. There was one that was older that got killed off the, fell off the bow of the Princeton Hall that was being built in our boathouse. And, and she was about five or six and broke her neck and passed away. What was her so, name? Annie. So how old were you at the time? I wasn't around the boat house. I used to like to play up in the woods, <laughs> you know. So ever my younger brother Louis saw that happen, you know. So we always considered the Princeton Hall uh, us boys mm -hmm. bad luck boat. Yeah. And there's two other sisters, 
No, one other sister. How many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, you stopped at Gina? Um, yeah, Gina and Annie. Gina, yeah. And Ruby. Seem like I'm missing two others. Well, that's seven. Yeah. Um, yeah. They all passed away early age, and that's why I have a hard time remembering. All of your sisters? Yeah, I was just a small boy, and you don't know what's going on. Yeah. All you know is somebody died, and it's your sister or brother, and you don't have any feelings. You know, you don't know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So did did most of them die of illness? Yes, I uh, I also had a brother called Ray, but he passed away at an early age too. From illness? Or uh, I'm not sure how old he was. Maybe three or four. I don't know. And your sisters, you don't know what they died of, or it was probably... Uh, tuberculosis was going around hot and heavy at the time, so I'm not sure whether that was even related to it. Mm -hmm. you know, all I know is they, they were early age and didn't make it. Mm -hmm. you know. That would be so hard on a parent. Yes. You, we, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, were you born at home or at a... Would you believe I was born in Chatham and raised here, Chatham Cannery? You were born at Chatham Cannery. I think uh, Bertha Karras, I think, was also born there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a popular spot. <laughs> Little, it was a cannery. Little place. Wow, so... You probably don't know if your mother must have had help. Did they have? They probably didn't have a doctor or anything. It, but. We had our place, our house there where my mother worked every year and my dad was fishing. So we always, and we even had, there was even a washing machine there. It was 25 years ago or so. Whenever we went back, it said still had Howard on the washing machine. You know, so there. now you can't go there because of the watchman that they they hired. I think it's uh, bought out by a lawyer. You know, so he owns it now and uh, pretty strict on um, having people go there now. So where was the washing machine in a cabin? It, or? Yes, it had Howard painted on it. So you always had your own... You, you always had your own cabin? Yes, and that's all it was, was a cabin. <laughs> we were shoved in there like sardines. But you're a little boy, you don't know, you know. <laughs> so, you, so you were going to Chatham before you even remember? Yes. <laughs> going on a boat progress, my dad's boat. Is that one that he built, or? Uh, no, I think uh, it's one of those that a, a cannery owned. I'd almost think because a lot of that uh, cannery stuff was given to guys that were good skippers, you know. Because hmm. I, I remember by the time I was six years old, five years old, I'd say five looking out the porthole when they're pitching out the fish of the boat. So, so you went along on the fishing trips? Well, my oldest brother uh, seemed like he always had to start the engine. They put a pipe in the front of the flywheel and, and pulled it. And that's what he used to do. And 
Then he'd have to get out of his bunk once in a while, and I'd watch all those rocker arms go in like this, and he'd have to oil them up with his oil gun, you know. So that was your brother George? Yes. How much older was he? He was about four years older. Let's see. No, older than that. My brother Marvin was a year and a half older than I, and George was a year and a half older than Marvin. So and he was a kid. Yes. I understand, too, that there was uh, uh, another child born before me that passed away, and I don't know who it is. I can't remember the name. Mm -hmm. But we were the last house in the village and the boat shop. Yeah, how do you know how um, how your grandparents got that that property? Was that a family, or was it just like after the end of the village, or the house and the village? Mm -hmm. How did your grandfather get that house site? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Or do you do you remember your your grandfather Howard at all? No. No, not at all. Only Peter Simpson coming down and visiting us, making us sit down on the floor by him <laughs> and listening to him. How how often did he come over? Seemed like it was every two weeks. And he'd talk about the Bible and talk about our manners, how important it would be coming, coming up in our age and everything, how important those manners would, would be for us. Did, did you ever work with him doing uh, woodwork or boat work? Yes, I started when I was 10 years old in 1944 with my dad. Um, every time I came home from school, I'd have to go out in a boat shop and uh, it helped help me plane the planks for putting on the boats, and it had to be certain level. So uh, he told me back then that I was a man at 10 years old and making a man's wage, you know. What about your older brothers? I won't say. <laughs> okay. So do you, do you, did you have more interest? Pardon me? Did you have more interest in that? I think, I think that or? might have been it. Because even at that age, I was told to use an ads, and a, you know what an ads is, uh, to make the bow stems out of yellow cedar stump. Mm -hmm. And how uh, he come and tell me what I had to do and didn't want to see any ends sticking up where I was using that ends. He said he wanted it smooth. You know, so I had to do that. Even at age 10. Yeah, so you must have been, you must have had some aptitude if, uh, you know, he's expecting you to do, you know, professional ads work with uh, and those are sharp tools. <laughs> mm-hmm. He trusted me with it. He never looked up, he never checked on me until I was all done with the whole thing. Then he'd come back and he made a, 
what they call a beveled square where it's adjustable. Mm -hmm. You put it against here and it could be tipped down and and he'd go right down down the bow stem with it, making sure that same way with the planks, you know, and use a beveled square on that and trust um, Check it on me. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. So he would cut the planks on a, did he have a bandsaw? Uh, I never used that. He never let me touch that. It was, he had a big long bench and I used to have to clamp them down. He'd clamp them down for me and then he'd make me, I had a long wooden plane that he'd make me use on the planks before he steamed them. So he would have like a pencil line for you to follow? No, he used a beveled square on that too. Okay. Yeah, so just making sure there's just enough angle for the cotton to go in. Oh, well, so you that, were, that's what I was doing. Oh, so you were cutting the, the bevel, the plank, the, the corking bevel. Yeah, Okay. for the cotton to go in too. Okay. It wasn't much of an angle. Mm -hmm. I've, I've built, or I've <coughs> Excuse me. replaced planks in boats. <laughs> no, no, I uh, I watched him do it, but he just put thing, little, little, little simple things out for me to do like mm -hmm. that. Okay. And um, do you know where, <coughs> so what me. boat was that for? He, when we first had that boathouse built, he, he was taking on repairing boats, other boats. And I've seen him take boat, law says that you're supposed to, you can take a boat down to the, the keel, and then rebuild it back up and it'll hold the same name, I guess. Mm -hmm. Because I seen him take one down, a little yacht, down to the keel, and then rebuild it back up for a guy by the name of Stockton Webb. I remember that. Because the guys would, I'd have to go out there, like I said, after school and help. And the guys used to put pennies in between the the ribs for me and watch me and make me feel like I was finding the pennies. <laughs> <laughs> what was what were you doing where you found that? I I had to do little things and I can't remember what it was, but they always I always wondered why they watched me. I must have been six years old, seven years old by then. You so know? like cleaning up No, it or? couldn't have been because it was Built in '39, I was five years old then, so it happened during the war. Hmm. And so, did your was your father building boats? Did you help uh, on? Yes, boats? yes, uh, he was, and I remember him building a a trawler by the name of Jenny. That recently. I think was demolished. Oh. It was still around till last year. Hmm. And then there was another boat, uh, the same boat he built that was uh, called the June K because it was named after a daughter June and it was done in June for fishing, a same boat for a guy by the name of Charlie Bennett, I think, from Angoon. Because they were working 18 hours a day on that boat to finish it for fishing. When did, when did sailing start? Or I guess July. the fish <laughs> were ready. <laughs> yeah. Huh. And then the last boat he built was called the Yota, G-O-T-A. Had two, two dots of, above the O, I guess. I guess that's Finnish. Okay. 
I think so. Yeah. Is that boat still around? It, well, I saw it here two years ago, and a guy by the name of Bill bought it. Sure. But the Princeton Hall, I guess they was built there too. And so here's and, a, oh, go ahead. And there was, the Princeton Hall stern of the boat stuck out of the boathouse about 10 feet, you know. And I remember guys coming down from Sheldon Jackson, I think. I remember seeing young guys there. And I learned later on, I think one of them was Jimmy Walton. Uh, Peter Squire Sr. Roy Bailey, I think. He talked about it. And I can't remember who the fourth one was. Um. Yeah, so I have a question too. You were, you said that the shop it was the Howard Brothers shop. Yeah. So did your uncle work there, or he was just one of? Yes, the he helped my dad, my dad's brother. So that was David. Yes. Um, does he have uh, Does he have descendants? Do you have cousins? On did um, so did did your uncle David Howard have children? Yes, he did. He had three sons, David Jr., Donald Howard, Walter Howard was the youngest, and they had a daughter by the name of Della. But when the Princeton Hall was being built, my dad had tuberculosis mm -hmm. and had to ask Andrew Hope to finish building the cabin. And then Andrew Hope signed off on it. Mm -hmm. The builder certificate. Yes. Yeah, no. The Navy, as soon as it was launched, the Navy took it over. Who, yeah. Do you remember who who were some of the other um, boat builders who worked with your dad? Like, were there other? I I can't remember who they were. Um, did your, so you, and your aunt was, I think my Uncle David worked with him for quite a while, though. Huh. Are any of his, are any of your Uncle David Howard's children still alive? No. So, um, but probably grandchildren? Yes, the, most of them are in Angoon. And I don't know all their names. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then your aunt was Tilly Hope? Yes, that was my father's sister. So did, were there other siblings? Oh, thank oh. you. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. They were starting to hurt. Yeah, I'm oh. worried about. Yeah, thank you oh, so much. Oh, thanks. Just don't let me get... <sighs> Oh, much better. Thank <laughs> you. I can see your grandma's. <laughs> so, um, I, so was it just your dad, his brother, and one sister, or were there? That's others? all I remember. Um, and then, um, so your grandfather was gone before you remember but um, do you remember your um, grandmother Howard yes our 
Katie Daniels. Was my I think was my mother's mother. Oh. Um. Paul Liberty was my grandfather. My mother's father. So, what was your mother's name? Helen. Used to be Liberty. And then Esther Thomas was my mother's younger sister. And Lillian Ward, my mother's younger sister. During World War II, Paul Liberty Jr. Uh, got murdered by a soldier boy over a woman down by Bayview. Wow. So was that, was World War II a pretty violent time in Sitka? Pardon me? Was, was the World War II time, was that pretty violent in Sitka? Was there a lot more? Violence? It was just getting started. Most of everything around here, I think, got 80% done. Uh, the Navy took over our boat shop in World, World War II. They even posted a guard in our outside the boiler, what we called the boiler room. They posted a guard there so you couldn't go in the shop. You turn right around and put the rifle there to block you. So you couldn't go in your own family's no. shop? So I'm sure they did the same thing to Andrew Hopes because the Navy took over all the boathouses, like my dad's and I'm sure Andrew Hopes. And the Navy took over Conway Dock, Dock now, which is Sitka Sound. And Standard Oil at the time, and now Petro Marine. And then the Army took over uh, Pyramid Cannery right next to us, down at the end of the village. And they had guards there too. So I wonder why. Uh, Sitka had quite a bit of servicemen around here then. You had the CBs building the roads. You had the um, CBs building the airfield over there. And uh, you had the Navy the Marines, the Army, CBs, and seemed like just one other one. Because when I was 10 years old and carrying a pocket knife and going over on a shore boat that going over to Japonsky Island, uh, there must have been About eight S SP um, MPs there on top of the ramp, and then you had to stand up against the building, spread eagle, and they frisked you, and they took my pocket knife away for cutting oakum because I was going with my dad to work on a Navy barge that was upside down in Sealing Cove now. And then when you came back, you got frisked again, you know, boarding the shore boats, what they called the shore boats at the time. So um, did your dad do very much work over there? So was it just that one job, or did he do other work? No, he had several little jobs uh, just because he had 
things going on in the boathouse and the boat that needs to be repaired, like for Kermit Olson had his boat there. She seemed like another guy had his boat there later. I think his name was Tommy Thompson from Kalinan Bay. Um, plus, we had to work on a little tugboat that belonged to the Navy over there. The tugboat's name was Diane. Oh. And I had to paint it when I was 10 years old, so you've seen it for years where it was three quarters painted from, from the bow to the stern. So the last of because they only gave me one gallon of paint to paint with, no more, and that's, and I, when I looked at the can and I was half, three quarters done on the one side, I thought, uh oh, if I go around the boat, then it means ha the other quarter of the boat's not gonna be painted from the front. So I went around the front and painted the front to the back again. So the back of the boat was not painted at all. And it stayed that way for 40 some years. <laughs> And your, your shore boats that were going over what they called shore boats before the bridge, whereas one of them was the Arrowhead, the Teddy, the Diane, and the Dorothy. Those are the ones I can remember. So, um, Totem Square at the time of World War II, every Friday night and Saturday night, our city police disappeared and the SPs and the MPs were out in full force because of all those different branches of servicemen coming over from from Japonski mm -hmm. and hitting the bars would turn, turn into a, a brawling place. Mm -hmm. So you'd go there Sunday morning or Saturday morning and look and see all the blood from from the guys fighting. Mm -hmm. They were boys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were boys. The one soldier boy we were talking to at Pyramid Cantonry was 19 years old, and he looked old then. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, what were the bars at the time? There was a. Um, all the servicemen hit all the bars. Mm. And that's why they, when they got all drunk up and feeling good and everything. <laughs> Was that? <laughs> That's just the way I look at it. I'm sorry. You know, blowing up the muscles. <laughs> oh, then then oh, they I go see. fighting, you know, Superman. Oh, oh. It's a Superman. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, That's the way I looked at it. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably, <laughs> probably a lot of truth there. But most of the servicemen you saw were, were their late teens, you know? Mm -hmm. That's boys. And their mothers far, far away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Walt Dangle probably remembers more about this stuff than I do. He was actually helping build most of that stuff, I'm sure, over in Chaponsky. You know, so Walt would be a ideal person that would be, should be brought into the picture to tell yeah. his stories. Yeah, because I've, I've talked to him about, you know, like what they did here, but I don't think it even occurred to me to ask him about, you know, the, the trouble that, <laughs> yes. that the young men got he's, into. He's yeah. sharp. Yeah. 
yeah. a wonderful friend. Oh, neat. How did how did you get acquainted? Like from through one of his daughters. Got to know the parents real well. Used to go visit them and listen to him tell stories about watching him tell stories. You could see him like seeing him see the pictures that he's talking about. Um, so, and then going back, uh, so do you remember your father's mother at all, or was she gone? No, when? my father was born in cake. Oh. Hmm. So I never got a chance to meet that side of the family. So his parent, so, uh, um, and then also, like, his parents were at the cottages at one, like, you know, a hundred years ago. Yes, it so was. Did you feel any uh, connection with the cottages, or? It, <laughs> it was like, uh. Like a fence shouldn't have been there, you know. I don't know why there seemed to be such a hard feelings, not real hard feelings, but bad feelings between there and, and the village. <laughs> <laughs> but there was. But, uh, during the war, they had a big barge out in the middle of the channel that was drilling and blasting those rocks where the, the buoys are now. And it caught fire, and we had to be evacuated from the village to the cottage. <laughs> and they had a tsunami once. They called it the tidal wave. and. To me, even as a boy, wondering why they took us from where we were and put us at the cottage with what I considered lower ground. <laughs> wow, yeah, that, that does seem strange. <laughs> it did to me. <laughs> Excuse me. So was that kind of awkward? Yes, it was to me. But we had to stay there because... They told us to do that, you know. For how long? Was it like days or? No, it was like overnight. Hmm. Although you're, um, so Peter Simpson, um, like, like I remember you mentioned before you called him grandfather. Yes. And he, he lived there at the cottages. Yes, he did. <clears throat> Excuse me. So did you stay, do you remember, did you stay at his house or somebody? No, we house? stayed, usually we stayed with a, a little field. I forgot what. Hmm. What his name was. Jones. Pete. Pete Jones. Oh. He was married to Esther Littlefield. Hmm. That's where we went most of the time. Um, and then, so more, more genealogy. So you're, you're, Mother was a Liberty? Yes. And um, I guess I wrote it on the other page. And her her mother's... Katie Daniels. Okay. Because she remarried. 
my grandfather, Paul Liberty Sr., I understand had, I'm thinking like a tumor in the head, the head because I was told that they kept putting ice packs on his head until he passed away. And I think he, I'm just guessing now that he might have been around 37. I don't know for sure. I know he passed away at a young age. That's all I know. And your, and your uh, grandmother, so that was, so then she married? And to the Daniels. I'm thinking that's, because I should have brought a picture of, I thought Liz gave you one, Karen. Yeah, I made copies of it, and I gave you back the original okay. today, but I'll have those copies today even, that we can. Okay, because she's got the picture, you know, so you'll see four children and uh, my grandfather standing and my grandmother holding Paul Liberty Jr. and seeing my mother uh, probably, I'd say 11 years old at the time. And my Aunt Esther, probably nine. And Lillian, younger. And Paul Liberty Jr. was uh, held by my grandmother in that picture yeah and what was what was your um grandmother's name before she married forgive me for after my heart attack i have lost parts oh. <laughs> you know that's 20 some years that i have forgotten things And um, oh yeah, and then were you? Um, it's funny. I was talking to uh, Janet Evans and your niece. Uh, she was Janet Howard. She was Janet Evans. Who? Um, Janet uh, Evans. Oh, Dan Evans. Yeah, yeah. And she said she uh, she was wanting a copy of that picture of the of the um, you know the boat shop. Um, yes. But she said she remembered um, getting seagull eggs for uh, her grandmother, your mother, and getting her Labrador tea. Yeah, <laughs> we did a lot of things when we were kids. <laughs> Climbing around that boathouse, I wonder we didn't get killed. <laughs> anyway, it was a yes. We did things like that. Well, so, and that was something else. I was wondering how much, how much native culture was in your upbringing. Like, was there very much, um, like, did people speak Tlingit when you were young? Yes, but we were raised not to because our grandfather, Peter Simpson, said you're coming into a new world now. Uh, we don't want the white people to make fun of the way you speak after you've learned, so we're not going to, your mother's not going to teach you to speak it. But I understood quite a bit of it at the time because they use it quite fluently. So all the all the older generation. Yes. Um, and then what about um, like cultural things? Like did you know like people's names or clan affiliations? Was that part of your life? I knew most, uh, well, I knew a lot of all the village people's names back then. You know, because we were at the end of the village. Then the Gray family was the next one up from us. Walter Gray family. 
and up from them and across from Murray's was Johnny Littlefield's whole family. Nick Peters family and Eddie Marshall right there where the airplane float is now what used to be where the same boat tied up and they called that Victoria float at the time hmm. and we used to tie our same boat up there and all the same boats tied up there And then from there was Morris White. Oh, I missed one other big family. And that's uh, the John family. There was Peter John, Alex John, and Johnny John, three brothers. In three homes? Yeah, three different home houses. And uh, up the street from him was, from them, it was Morris White, and just across the street, really. And um, then was Alex, Alex, <laughs> sorry, I forgot what no, he said. <laughs> That's yeah. great. And then the Kitka family. Frank Kitka. Yeah, I can go on and on. Your list would be pretty big. <laughs> yeah, no, I've seen, I was, I don't know if you've seen the big map that Gil Truitt made of the village, like Front Street and Back Street. Yes. I knew them all. And there's, yeah, yeah. there's like hundreds. <laughs> of yeah, that, and you're right. I thought, my I goodness, you you're lifted me. <laughs> <laughs> I go on and on and on. <laughs> so were you were you aware of clans? Like of what? Clan. Yes. So. So you, like, you grew up knowing what clan you were? Yes. What? It was always drilled into your head who you belonged to, what clan you were. I'm Eagle. My wife lives as Brown Bear underneath the Eagle tribe, which was a no-no back then. Oh. So for years, we never got invited to any big parties, you know, um, tribe parties, ravens, crows, and, and coho and all that stuff, invited to eagles, the, the bears, and things like that. And when, when, when did you start to be included? Pardon me? How long? Ago, did you start to be included? When were you invited, finally? Uh, Liz finally started to get invited about 35 years ago. But for the years, uh, the chiefs were pretty strong then. And it would not let things like this happen. And that's why Herman Davis, uh, I mean Herman, Kitka and his wife, Martha, were never invited to anything. And that's why Herman Kitka could never be a chief. Oh. He was up for it, but the Tlingit way, actually the Tlingit way, mm -hmm. uh, he was never able to take that. Because we were considered like, no, no, almost like outcasts, you know. And the chiefs were pretty hard on that at the time. And I always thought for years growing up that they were 
mean old men, but realizing now as I'm older that what they fought for was to hang on to our way of life and who we are. You know, nowadays you see people carving, making their own regalia. Back then the chiefs would say, no, you're not going to do it. So nowadays you just see everybody doing it mm -hmm. because their chiefs are weaker now. So, so it used to have to be by the opposite? Yes, always. So the opposite tribe was always looking to marry the opposite. And that's the first thing when you go to small villages like Angoon, Cake, Wrangell, Petersburg, Huna, Yakutat that they ask you what tribe you are. And who do you come from and what house do you come from? I'm not into all that stuff because I was never raised with Liz being invited to so many things mm -hmm. understands that more than I. And Herman Davis, people like that. He's a chief now, so they understand that more than I. Mm -hmm. I'm ignorant in that field. Do you, I mean, do you wish that you were? That do you wish that you had been more? Uh, uh, do you wish that you'd learned more when you were younger? Yes. We listened to, uh, it's what, like once Moses Johnson came to visit me and said a long time ago, we were not taught how, what each thing it word meant. It was never written down. Nowadays it's written down. Where we, when we were younger, what Moses was saying is we learned by listening. You know, there's no such thing as writing it down. And that's how I learned, is by listening. But I only know a few words now. Um, and then you went, uh, you went fishing with your father. Yes, I did for um, seven years. I started at the age of 13, took me out of school to go halibut fishing with him as a fish cleaner. And at that time, halibut fishing went for a whole month of May. So I never got a chance to finish school because every year after that, he took me out of school the 1st of May. So. Then I got stuck in eighth grade, so I never finished eighth grade. Wow. So was that, um, I mean, he just really needed a deckhand? Well, yes, there were three of us brothers aboard the boat and my dad, and that was all. My two older brothers and myself. And that's all for halibut fishing, and then the, you had to have six guys for seining. So I ended up seining too. And fall fishing. So fall fishing was different from the... Yes, summer? that used to be the first week in October you would go fall fishing. Hmm. Where to? Sometimes you'd end up in Tenneke. You know, and fishing in there. All, all seem like all dogs, dog salmon then. Mm -hmm. There's probably only a few places with runs that late. Yes. 
Yeah. So was that commercial or was that? Yes, more? it was commercial. Huh. Um, so who were the other crew on the um, seining? With us. Sometimes my uh, cousin Virgil Liberty. And some other guys. Once in a while, Harold, seemed like Harold Kitka ended up with us several times. I loved fishing, but I had to quit when I married, got married. Things changed. <laughs> So was that, Big time. So was that Liz putting her foot down? <laughs> no, I actually realized back then you could not make a living. To me, it was being raised the way I was was feast or famine. Mm -hmm. Feast in the summertime when you're in springtime when you're fishing. Now when there was no fishing, you starved to the winter. You know, nothing, wasn't much to eat. So I chose not to have that happen with my own immediate family. Mm -hmm. So I decided to get a job. I had to quit fishing altogether. Mm -hmm. So was there any, because I know, um, like fishermen used to have a kind of reputation for end of the season and going crazy <laughs> and I don't know if that that was that a um, a factor in uh, I've never seen that or I mean, I've you never know, like, witnessed it I it could have happened but I never witnessed it oh okay yeah I, I think I got that idea from um, uh, Herman Davis so he might have been like different fish boat crews <laughs> yes he was on his father owned the okay same boat. That could have happened because Herman was uh, around a small cannery called called the uh, Todd Cannery. That cannery was just probably four or five miles from Chatham Cannery. I remember us selling fish there, seining, seining time. Selling fish at Todd. So you, your, so your family sold fish at Todd. Todd Cannery's not there anymore. Oh, but, um, but back. Oh, uh, not very often. No, okay. you were. Seemed like you. Uh, spent a lot of time traveling on a boat, you know, so you were, you were in Todd, and you were in Tennessee, you were in Chatham, you were everywhere. Hmm. Sitka, you know, a pyramid cannery selling. Huh. You had to sell it. If, you, if your same boat belonged to a certain cannery, that's who you had to sell to. So was your was your family mostly selling to Chatham, or uh, between Chatham and Sitka, mm -hmm. Pyramid Cannery? I remember watching them pitch out fish out of the hole when I was six years old at night and seeing the chain going up. And the fish being thrown in those chains and oh, the, the had conveyor. wood, yeah, they had wood between them, so the fish would go in there huh. and go up and then keep rolling. You could hear the clunkety clunkety clunk all night long, you know, pitching fish. Wow. So, so by the time I got older, I was doing the pitching. <laughs> <laughs> so are you using a pew? Yeah, huh? fish pew. <laughs> You stuck the fish, just, that's all you were doing, just like that, 20 minutes, huh. down the hole, you know, throwing them up on deck. Wow. So, and what was, so when you started seining, that was before the power blocks? 
power blocks didn't even come into the picture until I'm I'm thinking 1951 and and back then they were seventeen hundred dollars and back then that was seventeen hundred dollars was a lot of money. So you saying um, the old fashioned way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right here. <laughs> The, the power block. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So what was the process? Like, like what, how did seining work? Like, They had turntables on the same boat, what they called turntables. And they were power driven by a chain. And you'd hook them to the winch and that. And those things, <laughs> they were a joke. It broke down all the time, you know. The turntable or the chains. The chain would break oh. all the time because you're going so fast. Oh. And that would just turn the... Yes, the, the would turn whatever way if you made it set to the right, the, uh, the roller of the turntable would be that direction. The roller was attached to the turntable. Yeah, that's where the chain, uh, that chain came up mm -hmm. on the roller. And you're pulling it. Yes. Did you have gloves in those days? Like They were a nuisance. <laughs> <laughs> I never did use gloves. Well. They were a total nuisance. <laughs> the gloves were, <laughs> you get clumsy with them, you know. So did they have rubber gloves? Yes. Then, but they were just too yes. hard to use. Yeah, and your cloth gloves, you know, your white oak gloves. Wow. And then um, tell us about basketball, like when when did you first start playing basketball? I was self-taught. I uh, I started when I was probably eight or nine years old and using a tennis ball and opening a can of Campbell's soup and saving the bottom and cutting it out and putting it over a door jam and that's how I started. In, inside your house? Then I put the can there, made a hole on the bottom, and that's how I did it. What did your mother think about that? <laughs> they were listening to the radio. <laughs> so I, that's the way I, I was taught. I was never, I always wish I was taught with a coach, but I never was. That's how I started. Then eventually somebody found a, basketball hoop and then we put saying around it what saying we had for the for the basket you know then we found our dad's best wood and made a backboard for it <laughs> and then we bolted it up with his bolts up on top of the boat house and and somebody found a ball or something and that's that's the way I I was doing it measured 10 feet from the from the road to the top of the rim of the basket. So you're using, you were using Catlian Street for your basketball court. Yes. <laughs> we were at the end of the village. No car is going to come by. Mm -hmm. Only once in a while, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then the other boys from the village said, uh, did the same thing as us. They started coming down and eventually organized our own basketball mm -hmm. team. Of, uh, and then who did you play? Just each other? We never won any games because we never had a coach. Oh. <laughs> but we played. My dad called us the Nighthawks. So that's how we started our name, the Sitka Nighthawks. <laughs> so 
so when you went to when you did go to school did you go to the to the village school to the public school yes i went to the indian native school down there until the sixth grade and in 1942 i think we went seventh grade do we our first year in public school and that was very interesting and we, our, our classmates from then are still our friends, very good friends. I never got, like I said, I never got a chance to finish school. So I just dropped out of school at the age of 16. I just quit. I thought my dad taking me out of school all the time. Mm -hmm. I won't ever learn. So mm -hmm. besides, I don't like getting up in front of the class and reading. <laughs> oh. um. You're lucky to have me doing this. Take that off of there. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then so who were, um, but you, so you played basketball as a kid, but then you kept playing all the way up until age 60? Yeah, we played in the gym here, the old gym, against oh. Sheldon Jackson a lot and lost all our games, like I said, because we had no coach. <laughs> so were you always playing as the Nighthawks, or did you ever play like... No, I went to a lot of other teams eventually. I was the big boy of... Six foot one for the Nighthawks. I was the center at 16 years old. Huh. Then I eventually got the age of 21, I think it is, 20 years old, something like that, before you can play City League. What were some of the teams you played on? He was, I played on so many teams. Oh. <laughs> I started Ernie's Old Timers, Stan Filler. I can't even think of all the names I, I played for the other teams. Hmm. But I loved the game. Yeah. To me, it was watching other guys that were just naturally born athletes and could handle the ball so beautifully. Hmm. And knowing that I was playing out there against them. Uh -huh. This made you feel good. Yes, it did. Huh. No, and I was playing against the Hall of Famers. <gasps> you know, Herbie Dedrickson, Itchy Hanson, Roger Lang, mm -hmm. Buddy Lang. All the Hall of Famers, you know, <laughs> Itchy Hanson. Richard Hansen is oh. his name. <laughs> and other players from out of town. Sitka Nighthawks and fifteen and forty nine. 1953, I think we went to Juneau with Sitka Nighthawks. Hmm. No coach again. <laughs> Lost two games out of the tournament, just like that, <laughs> bang, bang. <laughs> wow. Um. Yeah, I, I think I've... Um, Well, actually, if, if there was a, because I, I remember you, you told before about 
breaking your dad out of the TB sanitarium? Pardon me? Um, yeah, I remember you told about um, breaking your dad out of the TB hospital. Oh, yes. So did yes, he when we went to visit him at Alice Island, he told me and my brother Marvin to wait until it was dark and then come and get him. And we did. He used to also make me, no, my mother used to make me go what we called Indian medicine. I used to have to go up to the Muskeg and where Balachley School is now, it used to be a Muskeg there and Molo Park. That was all part of the Muskeg. I used to have to go up there and get what they called a Hudson Bay tea. Looks like trees in Hawaii hanging down. That's what those. Yeah, I used to have to go get that. And I had some roots that grew around the little cliff rocks, long roots. Um, They're like licorice. Mm -hmm. um, also, Devil's Club. I had to get six stocks of that. Mm -hmm. And a little spruce pitch. My mother would boil all that together and it would look like strong black tea. My younger brother Louis got tuberculosis when he was in his sophomore year of high school and they let him go and the doctors pronounced him that he had tuberculosis and could no longer go. So I was going up and getting the medicine for them and watching my mother boil them, not always, not standing there watching them. I just watched it, put, starting to put things in, and I would go. But my brother Louie would get on our 12-foot plywood boat and probably a 10-horse motor, I don't know, and would leave the house in the springtime around 6 o'clock in the morning with a gallon of that medicine. And three months later, the doctors pronounced him 100% cured. Hmm. But he never went back to high school. He is now living in Hilo, Hawaii, and totally blind. And when we were fishing, halibut fishing, he came aboard as the last son. Got seasick a lot. Oh. And my dad made my brother Marvin and I take our plywood boat off the top of the hay rack, therefore putting all our halibut our buoy lines and buoys in there for halibut fishing. We took that all, threw it all on the deck and put the boat in the water and took our brother Louie to buy Little Bjorka in the kind of rough weather. And we took a, my dad let a, made us take a, a mug ashore to make my brother Louie drink three of that. And that's what he drank and no more seasick. So what did he drink? The suds off the beach, breaking the suds. Oh. He drank three of those. And after that, he never, huh. never got sick. Wow. And he was our cook.
So when you said your So when he went so when he had um when he was diagnosed with T B and he would go out in the boat was he, that did he go every day? He um, went every day by himself and went out amongst the islands. I, he was fourteen years old. And he, like I said, he left six o'clock in the morning and would come home six o'clock at night with his jug empty and uh, eat very light and go to bed. Then get up the next morning, take his sandwiches and take his jug of medicine with him and disappear. Until he was well, three months later, I finally asked him a few years ago what he did on the islands. He said, most of the time, <laughs> sorry. Most of the time, he just sat out there and bawled. Yeah, that's really hard. You know, and I asked him what he ate. He said, uh, I'd find strawberries once in a while. And he said, I'd find some small clams and eat them. Anyway, he got cured and he was yeah. me, knowing my brother. When he went to the doctor and they examined him, the doctor said, you're 100% well. What wow. did you, what kind of medicine did you take? This is my brother. He said, I'm not going to tell you because you wouldn't tell me what you're going to give me, so I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> that was my brother. <laughs> That's my brother, Louis. <laughs> That medicine also worked on my sister, Ginger or Shirley, whatever. She like calling being Shirley now. She had abscess on her, I think it's her left ankle. And I had to get more spruce, I mean, yeah, spruce pitch for the medicine. My mother put it on her ankle because the medicine that was Getting, she was getting from the doctor back then, wasn't working, not touching it. And there was a big abscess on her ankle. And it, it healed that too. So um, do you know, did your mother have particular expertise or was that just what moms knew? That was what mom knew. Yeah. And she knew exactly what portion. I've seen parts of the Devil's Club floating in the salt water after I'd come home from her cutting off just what she needed because it's pretty potent stuff. Mm -hmm. Wow. And she had a big pot that she'd boil all that stuff in. I used to have to get a three quarters of a shopping bag full of Hudson Bay tea. Go up there and spend all my time bending over and pulling all those little leaves off of the wood. Yeah, filling it up three quarters full. Wow. And back then, Blatchley, where Blatchley School is, being a muskeg was the wilderness. <laughs> wow. 
Wow. Part of the wilderness. <laughs> so was there still the uh, the Brady farm up above your house when you were a No, kid? it wasn't a farm. It, we called it the John Brady. And that mm-hmm. property belonged to the Pyramid Cannery. Hmm. And it was a big, beautiful grassy area, never been mowed, never needed mowing. And it was beautiful and I I, I always wish that the historians had stepped in back then and stopped them from making it ugly now that it is an eyesore, the eyesore that it is. Because it used to be so beautiful, just beautiful there. And so big, you know. People could have benefited from it by just sitting there at nights in the summertime or in the spring and when it's sun shining and sitting on the grass and enjoying the beauty, you know. Up on the hill? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we called it John Brady. I have no idea who has the pictures of it. I got little pictures of it, but not covering the whole thing. So That's one of the pictures no... I gave Karen, I think, with hmm. my mother, my father standing up there. Oh. Um, was there any house there? No, we were the last house in the village. And before the war, there was just a little pathway continuing around Mm -hmm. Catlian Street. It stopped there. Then the Filipino bunk house was next down from us. Oh, for the pyramid? Yes, for the pyramid cannery. The Filipinos lived there. That worked at Pyramid Cannery. I knew it's just a little pathway and where the doctor's office is now it used to be a little white, beautiful white house and a little river, a little stream coming down. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> that was so idyllic. <laughs> yes. My mother used to make me go down there with her to get water because before we had running water and she'd make a cup out of Skunk cabbage. She'd make a cup out of that and then she'd dip it in the little river and make me drink out of it. Then I'd have to help her pack the water to our house from there. In pails? So you were a busy little guy. (laughs) Yes, I was. (laughs) Yes, I was. Holy cow. Oh, the boats I built, uh, I realized my uh, using a a measuring tape that your mind starts to snap and and, uh, starts to work good. I haven't built a boat in four years, so my brain is not. I have a hard time with the measuring, not real hard time with the measuring tape, trying to figure out the fractions of the inch. Uh-huh. 
That's what you're dealing with at the boat. You don't use a level and you don't use a square on a boat. They're useless. Uh, I got a brain like, I will tell Liz, like a computer. You give me numbers and they stay in there. Uh -huh. You know, after I've seen them, I've heard them twice, then my brain's got them. Wow. But give me names, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> really, not, not just this thing here, inside here, before I'd go to, when I'd go a step aboard a boat and the guy tells me what he wants done, I don't do, I won't do it anymore because I'm now nudging on 82. Because um, my legs don't work too well. Mm -hmm. And I built those boats all by hand, so my shoulders and arms are no good anymore. Oh. They hurt a lot. Anyway. When I, when I listen to them, what, tell me what they want on their boat, and it's like when I look at where they want, like a boat, building the cabin on a, rebuilding the cabin on a boat, I have done that. My friends would tell me how, what exactly what they want, and it's like this this thing in here snaps, and takes the original picture, and that snaps two more times looking at the fine things first and then finishing the structure and then it snaps the third time then it's already built in my brain huh. so so do you think how much of that what what all did you learn from your father yeah that was my father so and before how, like did he um did he like teach you or was it more no. you were watching him more like working and watching watching him and uh, seeing what he could do with he never finished the third grade mm -hmm. but what he did with that wood that he was building on boats mm -hmm. and seeing how beautiful it was when he got done so did he use half models did he carve out uh, half if he or? did it was a piece of wood like this carved out of out of red cedar, and then he'd cut them in sections. Okay. And then reality, I, I've never seen how he did turn this model from here to a 38-foot boat. Mm -hmm. And seeing how, how he already knew what it's going to look like before he even started. Mm -hmm. That's what I grabbed, the way I did it. Yeah. You know, and I like doing it because knowing that you're looking at your hands and already knowing what you're doing out there, and it's already in your brain. It's already done when you look mm -hmm. before you start. Although that's what's fun is when things don't, or that's, or that's what I really enjoy making things, is you try something and you're like, oh, that's different. <laughs> And then you have to figure it out, like how to make it. <laughs> That's me. I liked taking outboards apart when they were new. And then seeing what made it click. Oh. Then you'd get down there and you'd say, ah, oh, that's what makes it go. So you'd, you'd start putting it back together exactly the way you took it apart. I would be frightened to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I was 16 years old when I had took out a big engine out of my dad's big fishing boat. The boat missed our boat. And I was, I was like you, Rebecca, I was afraid to do it. And I was asking the old men, they were walking by, how am I supposed to do it? And they uh, would just grunt at me. So I thought my dad's words were, if you're going to learn anything, keep your mouth shut and eyes and ears open and you'll learn. So I started taking it apart 
and trying to memorize things, and I did. But one final little thing was called the distributor cap because it was a big eight-cylinder engine, straight eight, big engine. So this was the boat engine? And it came out of the boat. I took it out of the boat and put it up on the cannery dock and put the rings and bearings in it and everything. But the one final thing I forgot to do is looking at the timing timing marks on the distributor cap to make the engine fire mm -hmm. because it was a gas engine. Uh -huh. So they had to put it on the third mark because I goofed up on the flying wheel. Oh. I didn't look at the flywheel to see what where was it? What the mark was. Yeah, where the, where the mark was. Huh. I did it by myself. Nobody else helped me. That's crazy. So it stopped working, and then, so you had to rebuild it? Yeah, then when I rebuilt it, it worked fine. Huh. So but I just was off on two marks, you know? Huh. So, so did you, like, um, rebore the cylinders, or... or Yes, I used a honing thing inside. They gave the cannery. Uh, That's crazy. <laughs> I was 16 years old when I did that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what's that saying? Where there's a will, there's a way? Yeah. <laughs> and perseverance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, when I, I think about that, I think about my brother Louie out on the islands, you know. Yeah, I, I, um, I went to school with his daughter. Like, she did, we, we just lived a, a block away. But, um, but well, I, I, didn't, I didn't know her parents at all. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I learned a lot. A lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to. I don't want to uh, uh, wear you out or make your knees completely. I'm glad you don't have a camera. 